Whether you rent, own, or hope to buy a home, in much of this province, the cost of housing has simply outstripped affordability. What can and should the Ontario government do about that? Well, let's find out what the major parties are proposing with Peter Milchin. He is the current Minister of Housing and the Liberal candidate for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Toronto City Councillor Denzel Menon Wong, PC candidate for Don Valley East. Peter Tabbins, NDP candidate for Toronto Danforth. Stacey Dankert, Green Party candidate for Kitchener Centre. Welcome everybody to our little table here at TVO. Thank this you. is a good opportunity for a little hashtag on Pauly nerd moment because, <laughs> because you're still a minister in the government of Ontario, yes. but you're no longer an MPP. Correct. And you're no longer an MPP. Correct. I'm and a you're candidate. You're trying to become an MPP. But still a city councillor. But still a city councillor. And you are none of the above. Right. But you've got your head in there anyway. Anyway, that just shows you the government of Ontario trucks on, even though the House has been dissolved and there are no, are no MPPs anymore. You're welcome. That's all I'll say. Okay. Let us, now that I've got that out of my system, Sheldon, can we put this graphic up, please, that we can talk about? A Leger study from last summer found that most Canadian millennials, we're talking people aged 25 to 30 in this case, do hope to purchase a home in the next five years, but... 72% of those surveyed in Ontario say housing in their region is, for them, unaffordable. And 59% would like to buy a detached home, but only 30% think that they actually will be able to afford it. So let's get into some discussion about this. Uh, Peter, T um, well, we've got two Peters on this side of the table, so it's going to be first and last names now. Peter Milchin, how well, in your view, has your government, in which you've been in the cabinet, not all the time, but some of the time, uh, dealt with rising home prices in this province. So we introduced the Fair Housing Plan uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, precisely to address uh, issues of affordability. And on the ownership side, uh, putting in place the, uh, the non-resident speculation tax, uh, similar to what was done in BC, a little bit different, uh, was a key part of that, was to, to pull out of the market uh, to the extent that there, that there was uh, about 5.8% of the transactions in the GTA were by non-resident people, uh, many of them speculating on the increase of uh, new home prices and even resale homes. So we brought that in, and we've seen in that period of time those non-resident transactions drop from about 5.8% down to, I believe, the last figure was about 3.4. So the data's worked and it's had so some effect. It's had a psychological effect, mm -hmm. I think, was the, the more uh, important part of it, as we, you know, we had home prices going uh, month over month up by 30% at one point. Mm -hmm. So now we've had a slight price reduction, uh, prices are going up at, at sort of a normal pace now, and we see that you know homes are a lot more affordable. That that was part of it. Uh, opening up uh, provincial surplus lands for redevelopment for purpose-built rental housing, with 30% of them being set aside for uh, somewhat below market uh, rentals, was another part of trying to open up uh, more supply. Uh, to create more affordable options for people in terms of rental and also uh, affordable housing. And then we also brought in inclusionary zoning, which is a tool to allow municipalities to leverage private sector development into some additional homes to be built that could be uh, below market uh, rates, whether they're rental or ownership. So your, your view is with that mix of items and a few more as well, housing is more affordable today than it was, say, before you took over. Uh, certainly in the last year and a half, we've seen uh, house prices stabilize, in some cases uh, go down. Uh, we need to do more on the rental supply, but we've introduced uh, development charge credits uh, for municipalities to use that as an incentive uh, for uh, rental housing builders to build more of that. So we're, we're tackling the various elements of the housing okay. market. Let's get some feedback. Denzel Minwong, your view on how well the government's done over the past, certainly the time that Peter Milchin's had the job, but let's say for the, uh, for the time since Kathleen Wynne has been Premier over the past five years and change. So Peter and I can, can agree on a couple of things. I, I think this um, idea of inclusionary zoning um, and providing more affordable housing uh, makes a certain level of sense. Um, and I, to, to, to the point that even on this particular site, uh, where we are doing the, the television program tonight, there's a proposal, a very large development proposal, where the city is putting in affordable housing units. I think affordable housing is 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 a way forward. We've done that at the city through Build Toronto and Waterfront Toronto. We're building more affordable housing. I think that makes some level of sense. Um, it's not going to get us all the way there um, because uh, 
um, the governments can't create enough housing. Um, Where's the there you want to get to? Where, well, where, where, these, where all, all, all of the millennials or people who, who are, aspire to, 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 uh, to own a home get to the place where they can actually think about it and start making some down payments. Um, you know, the foreign buyer tax limited success. It only, foreign buyers, I think, only make up 10% of the market. I think it was less. What did you say it was? It was 5.8 when it started. Now it's down to 3.4. So even less. Um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, we, you know, the, the, the Doug Ford and the Conservative Party believe in put, putting more, more money in people's pockets so that they can save up some of their, s s some more money for that, that deposit, uh, uh, you know, uh, cutting taxes for the middle class. Um, people on minimum wage, they also want to, uh, uh, they, they want to buy a home one day and, and not, uh, not charging them provincial sales tax, uh, uh, credits toward uh, daycare. So, you know, if you have a young family, it's even harder to save up that money for that down payment on a house. So the Conservative Party is offering those type of incentives to the, even to the point of uh, uh, reducing the gas tax by 10 cents. We believe in putting more money in people's pockets so they can save up for that, that, that precious down payment and so they could start uh, buying their own home. Okay. Peter Tavins, your view on the record so far? I still hear a lot of frustration at the door, Steve. I think a non-resident speculation tax is a good idea. In fact, the NDP thinks we should go further. We should take another piece from British Columbia, a speculation tax on houses that are vacant, uh, because we need to have a motivation for those who own those buildings to actually rent them out or sell them. Having them sit there not being used is a real problem. Uh, I think we need very large-scale investment in rental housing, affordable housing. I think that. By whom? Uh, well, I think the government's going to have to step in. We propose 65,000 units in our first 10 years. Uh, if you look at the demand in the GTA in Ontario, uh, you need to have that kind of housing for people living if they're going to save up and buy later. Um, and strangely enough, Denzel and I agree on some things, um, putting money into childcare so that young families aren't stretched to the limit, paying as much in childcare as they are, as they would pay for a mortgage. That's really critical. That's why we're proposing uh, $12 a day average childcare for families making over 40,000 a year. We need those kinds of incentives, those kinds of supports to make sure that people can pull the money together so they can buy in the future. But if we don't deal with the speculation, and I think we need to be more rigorous about that, then it's always gonna be difficult to, uh, for people to buy in because there will always be upward pressure on prices, driven not by local need, but by the interests of investors who want to maximize the amount they're going to get out of the system. Stacey Danger, where are the Greens on this? Uh, yep, so we see, we see the housing issue as something that's um, broader, which has sort of come up a little bit, and I'll, I'll make sure to touch on that as we uh, talk this evening. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that we are also are thinking about, in addition to the ideas that have already been mentioned, is things like making sure that we're doing mixed-use, medium-density housing. So working with municipalities to ensure that we're using the land that we have available for development in creative ways. Uh, that may mean um, bylaw changes or zoning changes, um, making sure that, that we can we can use that space as, a, as efficiently as we can while still making sure that our neighborhoods are, are creating really nice, uh, strong communities. Isn't for that people. intensification? Is that what you're talking about? Um, yes, yeah, some intensification for sure is, is important. I don't think that it always has to be the big, ugly concrete blocks with surrounded by concrete. I think that there are other ways that we can do it. Um, more medium density can, can really fit in nicely to neighborhoods uh, as long as you think about the green space and how it's connected to uh, the different uh, commercial opportunities around integrating some shopping uh, along with the residents uh, can make for really nice communities. People enjoy walkable communities. So, mm -hmm. so we want to ensure that that's there. Uh, the vacancy tax, um, we, we should be getting rid of that. I think that it's an archaic idea that it doesn't any longer serve, uh, serve our communities because it is helping to drive up some of the costs uh, for, for the people. And, um, you know, in terms of changing zoning, you can also be thinking creatively about things like laneway housing, shared housing, cooperatives. What's laneway housing? <laughs> 
Um, I'm told. I heard a, a member at Mike Schreiner's press conference. Yeah, he said we yeah. could create 40,000 housing units like that tomorrow if we allowed laneway yeah. housing. <laughs> but I'm not quite sure what that means. Well, it's not going to work in all cities. So mm -hmm. just just some of the cities that actually have the laneways um, kind of between housing. So it's not a not an entire road. You could build homes there. You, you could build smaller homes. Very small really homes. Small homes. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. We've got a bunch of ideas around the table here today, and I wonder, Peter uh, Milchin, back to you first. I wonder how much government can actually do about any of this because, first of all, you've got, you got two realities out there, right? You've got sort of greater Toronto and Hamilton area reality where prices are really going, or had been uh, until very recently, uh, absolutely skyrocketing. And then you've kind of got the reality in the rest of the province, which is, you know, it's not. How do you create policy for two such distinctive realities? So, so it's, that's why there can't be one policy that solves all the problems. So. The non-resident speculation tax, that was about, you know, the GTHA. Uh, that wasn't about the rest of the province. Uh, but other parts of our policy, like uh, expanding rent control to all Ontario tenants, uh, an additional 250,000 uh, Ontarians now are under rent control protection that weren't there before. Is that a good idea? That, that extends uh, certainty and predictability to those people. It makes life uh, more, more affordable. Uh, we also made it more difficult for uh, landlords to illegally evict people. We brought in uh, the standard lease, which is a common lang plain language uh, lease for all Ontarians. Ontario is one of the last provinces in the country to, to bring that in. So, uh, but we have also the national housing strategy. For the first time in about 30, 40 years, we have a federal government that's back at the table in a serious way with housing. Uh, Ontario is going to be able to leverage that into uh, 20,000 new uh, affordable homes being created, and there's co-investment fund that will help uh, the private sector and co-ops and nonprofits uh, build even more. Uh, and I just want to take a little bit of exception with a couple of things that uh, Denzel said. You know, it's nice to tell people we're going to put more money uh, in your pockets and then, you know, you're off to the races, you can do whatever you want. Uh, but, you know, the people who are on minimum wage, that, you know, the increase in the minimum wage that was opposed by the Conservatives, uh, they're using the money that's in their pockets today out of that to pay their rent, to make it more affordable for them to live. Um, and delaying you know, further increases in the minimum wage isn't going to help them uh, make life more affordable. By the same token, you know, our plan to provide affordable uh, free childcare uh, to Ontario families, uh, that means that they can sign up for childcare and access it and they don't have to worry about how to pay for it for 12 months and then wait for a tax refund at the end of the year, which they may or may not uh, put away for a down payment. Okay, so, a number of so criticisms these are there. Let's real get him things to... that help people today. Let, let me get him to respond to the several criticisms you made there. Go ahead. Well, a couple of things. We actually believe that if we give people more money to spend it or save it, that that's actually a, a great solution. Um, you know, Peter's, Peter's party, his daycare solution is only good for a couple of years, where the Conservatives' daycare solution is good till, till age 16. So there's, there's a wider range, there's more money available, um, up to $75,000 over that term is available to a family. We think that's real money um, that people can put aside. Um, can I just understand that? Daycare available till age 16? Yeah, the, 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 the credit is available to the age 16. To, to age 16. People use daycare at the age of 16? Well, you have to take, take your kids uh, uh, and you put them in uh, after school programs, etc. I think daycare, that type of daycare. Okay. Yeah. Um, what so, about the minimum wage issue? He's a, he, I mean, there have been some independent studies done on the fact that, that the liberal idea to raise the minimum wage to $15 actually puts more money into the pockets of people than, say, the income tax holiday that the Progressive Conservative Party would purport to give. So the so the we don't we are not opposing the fourteen dollar minimum wage. It's You're the, opposing the fifteen. The fifteen dollars. We think that that uh, businesses are 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 hurt by the by the, by how quickly it's come about. A lot of businesses are being hurt. You look, you ask you ask a lot of kids. There are no summer jobs available because this has impacted businesses in quite a significant way. We think instead, um, our approach is to take off the uh, the provincial income tax. And give them the benefit that way, than rather rather than hurting business. Okay, but again, the independent studies have shown that that people do better their way rather than your way. And if the idea is to save as much money as possible so you can buy a home, 
independent studies say his way is better than your way. We think that this is, this is the right way to go. Um, uh, and then, so getting back to the housing issue, um, you know, one of the, some of the other things that we need to do, quite frankly, is we, have to, we need to reduce red tape. Uh, there are, you know... Like what? Uh, environmental assessments, all the things that a developer has to go through. We, you know, if someone if, is going to build affordable housing, we should give them, we should fast track them. Uh, we should have incentives for them to build their units and build them quickly. Um, the other thing that you mentioned is uh, people can't uh, uh, buy in the area they want. They're actually having to move further, further out to buy what they want. Mm -hmm. You can't buy in. City of Toronto is really expensive, much more expensive to buy a place than, let's say, some other place further out the GTA. That's why we have to focus in on, on having more accessible transit. You know, everybody, we're, we know that there, one thing that there isn't anything more of is land, right? Mm -hmm. And so as, 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 as was mentioned, you know, we, we, need, we need to build more mid-rise, but that's gonna add to congestion. So to make that, to, to allow to build more housing, uh, we're going to have to address the transit issue, and so... Okay, let me pluck one idea out of that. No more environmental assessments if you want to build affordable housing. Does yeah, that make sense to you? I completely disagree with that. Disagree? I mean, I, so we, we, may want, we may want to look at environmental assessments and assess what fully has to be taken care of, but frankly, why would you get rid of an environmental assessment? We have enough problem in this province well, with it, not yeah. taking care of the environment as is, frankly. I think the explanation but, is because it delays construction too much, and therefore elevates yes, the cost yes, of... Yes, but Steve, if you've got an underfunded Ministry of the Environment taking longer to process things, you can change that by dealing with the underfunding of the Ministry of the Environment rather than getting rid of an environmental assessment. Uh, we actually do need more investment in denser urban form. We need to take mm -hmm. advantage of the corridors along new transit investments. We should take advantage, as you were saying, uh, putting in mid-rise mid housing so that we have stacked townhouses, townhouses, uh, low-rise buildings. Along transit corridors, there's a real opportunity there to deal with congestion and with cost. It's a lot cheaper to have dense housing than it is to have sprawl, without that a is, doubt. That is certainly what the planners tell us. Do you know that that's, in fact, what people want to buy? Um, you know, if you were offering houses in my riding, at That's a the price substantially less, less than what they have to pay now, they would take it. Um, as I t go door to door talking to people, it isn't that they're fixated on a detached house with a big yard. What they want is a home in a neighborhood that they enjoy that has some amenities. Um, I raised my son in a, a housing complex with stacked townhouses. It was a good neighborhood with kids getting together, pretty high density. That's the kind of housing that makes sense and is far less expensive than single-family detached. We can encourage that. Our government will do that. Could a... Okay, the, the, just between the two of us, I don't think the Greens are going to be a majority government after June 7th. Maybe you'll agree, maybe you disagree, but, but would you argue, if there is any Green representation in the Parliament, mm -hmm. would you argue for some kind of new home ownership incentive program that would be aimed strictly at millennials to help them get started? I think that, um, that there are other approaches that you could take. Um, so increasing the inclusionary zoning, for example, I think could be a really good approach that if we build one out of every five houses to, to be affordable, then now all of a sudden your millennials that are looking to be buying uh, have have many more options. Just tell me what that means. One out of every five homes being affordable actually when rubber hits the road means or when shovel hits ground means what? Right, below market. Below market. Meaning uh, the, the other four subsidize the fifth? Is that how it works? Um, well, you would you would have to work with um, developers and municipalities to work out all of the specifics and exactly how that that comes to be. But I think that there are there are ways to offset the costs. It could be through um, density-related um, benefits that developers could receive, that type of thing that, that, um, that can offset some mm. of those costs. Peter Mitchell, let me take a completely contrarian's view of this, just for argument's sake here. Is it possible for somebody seeking office in this province during this election campaign to say, you know, this is one of the most expensive cities to live in in the world, and I'm really sorry, but there's just not... Governments can't solve all your problems. And if you can't afford to live here, you just can't afford to live here, and you're going to have to go somewhere else.
I mean, well, that's reality at some level, isn't it? Well, governments aren't going to magically create uh, detached, uh, new detached homes in the city mm -hmm. of Toronto. So it's going to be more dense housing. Uh, but, you know, in other communities as well, you know, we, there's things we can do to help promote uh, more compact housing, housing where people have transit as an option that can save them money on car ownership. Uh, but that requires investment, and that requires an investment in infrastructure and in our transit system. Um, and, you know, the, the bumper sticker slogans about we'll cut red tape and create more housing that way, you know, most housing doesn't require an environmental assessment. So that's not what's blocking a lot of development. What is? Um, uh, municipal processes often are. We've made changes to the Planning Act uh, that uh, encourage municipalities to put uh, community development permit systems in, which is sort of uh, all in zoning with a single permit as opposed to building permits and uh, rezonings and site plans. There's a single permit. Uh, municipalities are kind of slow to take that up because it's a change to the way they're doing things. Uh, I think in time they will, but that's something concrete that can speed up the process. But you need investment. So when Doug Ford, you know, uh, does his bumper sticker slogan of I'll take 10 cents uh, a liter off of your gas, he doesn't tell you that that's about a uh, billion dollars. And that billion dollars right now is the gas tax money that goes to Ontario municipalities let's to, just, to let, support transit. Let's and, do a check on that. Denzel you know, Minowong, did, did, did Mr. Ford understand that when he says he's going to take 10 cents a litre off the cost of gas, that that gas tax money right now goes towards municipalities so that, well, you know this, you're on Toronto City Council. Does he get that? Well, I, I think what we're doing is we're making more affordable. Gas tax, gas is going through the roof. Gasoline is going through the roof. And and he, and, uh, and, and uh, Doug, Doug Ford wants to reduce uh, the, 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 the pain. And that money is going to go into people's pockets that they can uh, use for other things. But get, you're conservative, right? You're a conservative. Well, I, you believe in markets. I, I, yeah, I do believe in markets. Mm -hmm. And, and it's... it's uh, you know, in terms of the accounting, I think it's 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 kind of ironic that uh, uh, Peter Milchin and his party are trying to lecture the Conservative Party about accounting when we look at what uh, the Liberal Party has done with regard to accounting and the Auditor General and the numbers that they're the the the, the, the untruthful numbers that they've been rolling out. And no, what what I'm saying is Doug Ford is making it up as he goes along. He drove by a gas station, saw a dollar thirty-five a, a liter. Uh, somebody said to him, that's pretty high, so well, I'll, I'll take care of that for you folks. I'll tell, take 10 cents a litre off. But he didn't tell them that he's going to have to take away infrastructure money for Ontario municipalities that's going to create more congestion. And when developers say one of the big impediments to building more housing and more affordably is lack of infrastructure funding to, to help develop these communities. So when the government takes money out of that, you know, uh, I'm not going to build a subway with the extra hundred bucks in my pocket. Uh, that's stuff that we do together as a society. And, you know, it's nice to offer tax cuts to people, but you also have to tell them what else you're cutting at the same time. Well, what I think, what I think Doug, 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 Doug Ford was doing and the Conservative Party was doing is, they, is, is they're, they're in tune and in touch with what the regular guy is thinking and, and how expensive it is to drive, to, to, to drive around in a car and how that's affecting families. And, and so he's sensitive to that and he wanted to do something about that. Um, you know, you look at uh, what, what, the, uh, what the Liberal Party's done on, on electricity pricing. We're paying $1,000 more in the last 10 years on electricity because of the incompetence of Kathleen Wynne and her okay, government. Okay, friends, friends, let's, uh, we want to get back on track here, which is about uh, hydro policy is another program. We're going uh, to talk about... Housing would be good, Steve. We're going to, thank you, good. thank you. We're going to go back to affordable housing. Um, Again, back to my original question, though, which was, Peter Tabbins, is it possible just to say to people, I know politicians don't like to deliver bad news to people, but there is something called, you know, truth. And the fact of the matter is, this is the most expensive city in the country and one of the most expensive cities in the world to live in. Can you get elected by going to people and saying, look, at so much of this is market forces, it's out of our control, and while I'd love anybody who made any amount of money to be able to live wherever they wanted, you know, in the city of Toronto, here's the reality. But I, I think the reality, Steve, is that there's a lot of room in Toronto itself for density, greater density. In my riding along Queen Street, we're seeing redevelopment with six, seven-story buildings, uh, condominium buildings that are filling in along Queen, providing housing that wasn't there before. Okay, so but I, let me, but let me no, ask sorry, you let me go back, though. Go ahead. Yeah. We're not here to promise miracles to people. What we can say is, realistically, we can intensify and put more units 
into Toronto, if that's where people want to live, or many other areas in the GTA or around the province. The question is, are you willing to try? Are you willing to take it on or not? Well, let me ask you about that, because you, 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 you in the previous, how many years you've been in there now? 10 Twelve. years? 12 years. You've represented the Danforth. Yeah. There's a subway line in the Danforth, right? But not on Queen. Not on Queen, but on, on Danforth. Yeah. Uh, there's no more added density on, you know, above the, you know, whatever it is, one and two story little uh, small businesses that are there, which presumably is very a very small amount. You're right. Overall, I agree with your argument. But interestingly, so how about an NDP government will pledge to make sure that we intensify those nodes right along subway lines, even if the neighbors who like only one and two story outlets right now squawk? Well, we would be supporting municipalities on this, but interestingly, and I don't know what the difference is between the two, along Queen Street, we're getting a lot of intensification. Uh, there's a transit line there, very popular one, and it doesn't seem to be a big issue with getting more buildings there. For reasons that are not clear to me, investors seem interested in building up Queen Street. I think part of it is the historic cost. Uh, the Danforth is a lot more expensive than it is on Queen. Maybe that's the reason, Steve. Okay. But what we've seen is a government that really has just been hands off. We were pushing for years, starting in 2009, for inclusionary zoning. This government, uh, Wynn government, only brought forward inclusionary zoning, I think, 2016. And Peter, you only brought forward regulations to implement in December of last year, just before Christmas, made Toronto Council go out of their minds. Everyone who was active in housing, very angry that your regulations undermine the whole push to require developers to put affordable units in new buildings. You backed off when there was tremendous pressure and we were going into an election. But you could have acted on this almost a decade ago. Let's and you give didn't. Me, give me well, a chance to respond. Uh, when, when Kathleen Wynne asked me to, to run provincially, I, I told her I will if you commit to real planning reform. You which were is, on City Council. Which was, I was in City Council. Uh, she said yes, and in this four-year period of time, we've done historic planning reform. We've uh, limited the types of appeals the developers can bring to overturn municipal decisions. We've done away with the Ontario Municipal Board, replacing it with a true appeal tribunal, and we've brought in inclusionary zoning. The, you know, Kathleen Wynne as Premier has done a huge amount in a very short period of time on, on reforming planning in ways that municipalities have asked for. And inclusionary zoning is a big uh, part of that. Uh, could it have been done 10 or 20 or 30 years ago? Sure it had. Sure but, but, but we did it during this mm. term. And I'm, I'm very proud of the work that we've done in this four years because those were the commitments I made to my community four years ago. And I can go back there and say everything I committed to do on planning reform, including inclusionary zoning, got done. Okay, let me change the subject here. I want to talk about something that has been a truly thorny issue in this province for, I'm thinking now, 43 years, which is rent controls. Uh, we got rent controls in Ontario in 1975 in the first place because the progressive conservative government of the day was about to lose an election. Bill Davis brought in rent review, and the situation that we have basically is what was brought in 43 years ago. Some fine-tuning, obviously, but, and let's start with the Greens on this one. Um, it used to be that if you built a new apartment building in the province of Ontario, controls wouldn't be on it if it was a post-1991 building. Now the Liberals have changed it. Rent controls are on everything. Was that the right move? Yeah, I would say I would say in that case it is. I think that um, we have to we we can't just wait to build new units uh, to try to solve the problem because of course more people are waiting for housing than are in housing and in mm -hmm. that in that situation. And so um, we have to do something faster. And this is. It's not just an issue of poverty, it's an issue of, uh, it's an economic issue as well. It's a health issue, it's an education issue. Because if people don't have long-term sustainable housing that is um, appropriate housing, you know, housing that you can really live in where the walls aren't paper thin and the smoke doesn't waft in and, um, and, and that sort of thing, then it, it causes a ripple effect in the rest of their lives that they tend to lead more transient lives, so their education isn't as consistent, uh, so that's problematic. Yeah, there are more health care. Yeah, yeah, I think that it all does start with house, okay. uh, housing. Let me get Denzelman and Wong. Do you agree with the government's change of policy to put rent controls on every building in the province, not just pre-91 built buildings? Yeah, the Conservative Party uh, 
uh, is status quo. We don't believe in changing the current uh, uh, rent control rules. Is um, that what you and your heart believe? It's what it's uh, in the platform. We've we've clearly stated there's uh, we're, we're not touching rent control. Um, we do have a problem though, and and you know as you touched on this, this housing issues. A very complex issue, and I and I 100% agree with everything you said about how important housing is. I think we'd all agree with that statement. It starts with housing. You got to have a place to live, and if you don't have a place to live, that's a really big problem, and no one wants to be in that situation. But we do have, um, I think, in the city of Toronto, it's a 1% vacancy rate. Province-wide, I think it's 1.7%. Um, and and there's not enough incentive, I think, right now for the private sector to build rental housing. Let me pick up on that. William Watson, admittedly a conservative columnist, writing columnist, writing in the Financial Post, uh, I guess a few days ago, had this to say. Rent control's goal is precisely to put prices out of whack, to keep them below where the market would set them. Once you do that, you create shortages and shadow prices. Shortages are simple. Sell something for less than its true market price, and you get more would-be buyers wanting to buy than sellers wanting to sell. That's almost definitional. The true market price is the one that equalizes the number of would-be buyers and sellers. Any other price doesn't. Peter Tabins, let me go to you on this. Um, how are you going to get more rental construction built if you put controls on everything, not just pre-91 buildings? Well, first of all, Steve, you may note that since 1991 till 2017, we weren't getting a huge number of new rental housing built. We weren't getting those units built, even though there was no control whatsoever. So we had this multi-decade experiment. It didn't produce this bonanza of market Maybe not a housing. bonanza. Are you going to get more now? The controls are on everything? Well, I think you have to understand there are two very different markets here. Because when you look at those who rent, particularly in Toronto, their incomes on the whole are about half those of those who own houses. Yeah. So you can build all the $2,000 a month units you want. They aren't going to be able to afford them. Mm -hmm. You've got a huge population that's feeling the pressure, that are being pressured by landlords who want them out because they can reset the rents when they go. You have to have rent controls in place if you're going to protect the population of this city and I think other cities where there's substantial I demand. understand what you're saying as a result, but, uh, according to those who are in, but those who are out, who are looking for a place to rent, how are they going to find more supply if none's being built? I, I think in that case, again, we go back to inclusionary zoning having to be part of the policy response. There's going to have to be government investment in this. If you'll remember back, and even going back before rent control, uh, the federal government was putting money into limited dividend buildings. You have to have a government component of the financing to actually build housing that most renters can afford. The market is not going to provide it. What we did see with the market being able to do whatever it wanted up to the time I provoked the government to bring in rent control, I brought in a bill ending the post-91 exemption. The government understood the political implications of not acting and acted. Um, but if you looked at that, we saw rents on condo units, rental condo units, going up 300 bucks a month in a six-month period, people being driven out. Mm -hmm. Investors want to maximize their return. That's just the way the system works. If you don't protect them, you're going to have large numbers of people driven out of their houses when they see, the investors see an opportunity to really crank up the amount of money that they're going to get. Let me get Peter Milchin on that, because I, I, I totally understand why you'd want to cover all buildings, because then everybody who's in is protected against egregious rent increases. What I still don't understand is, how do you get the private sector to build anything if they can't be satisfied about their return on investment because you put controls on everything. Those who are waiting to get in are going to be waiting longer as a result of this policy, are they not? So, as Peter said, since uh, 1991, we, d we didn't have a lot of new rental construction. Uh, you, you know, you had some luxury rental. Uh, in other communities in Ontario, you might have a little bit of rental built, but not a lot. Uh, the big change was in the 1970s when the federal government did away with some really lucrative uh, tax credits and tax incentives to build rental housing. Mm -hmm. Then we had a recession, then another recession, and what came out of that pe was people building condos, developers building condos, not rental, because those tax in incentives were gone. So what we've done is we've put in place $125 million for municipalities to provide incentives for uh, purpose-built non-luxury rental, 
And we've also freed up uh, provincial surplus lands, which I know uh, Denzel, working at the city, is working on city land being freed up for uh, more housing. Uh, in Toronto, the provincial sites so far, 3,000 units, um, with 30% of that being affordable. Uh, a site in Hamilton, about 230 units, I believe, again, 30% affordable. And there's dozens and dozens of other provincial-owned uh, sites all over the province that we're going to free up in various communities. By, and government, by selling those lands at a bit of a discount to ensure there's affordable housing in there, that's how we're going to trigger uh, more rental co uh, construction that's affordable. And it requires government intervention. You know, in the U.S., where they build huge numbers of rental units every year, they have tax incentives that we can't even imagine. Uh, for rental housing providers and, you know, uh, uh, doing away with, um, you know, what's called corporate uh, welfare, which may or may not be a good idea in some, some instances. Uh, but you need some government intervention in the housing market to ensure that for those who can't afford the full, uh, you know, market price of housing, that there's some kind of government help there. National housing strategy is a big part of that, but there's other things the province can okay. do as well. We are literally down to our last few minutes here, and I want to try one last thing with everybody. I need brief answers to make sure we get everybody uh, represented on this question. There are uh, Indigenous... Indigenous people are dramatically overrepresented among the homeless amongst us. And I want to know if any of your parties have something specific to deal with this concern. Who hasn't spoken? Stacey, you haven't spoken in a while here. Let's start here. Uh, so we, we do. We feel that we should be creating an Indigenous housing strategy, working with members within those communities as well as the provincial and federal government to ensure that we have um, a long-term plan uh, and immediate solutions to try to um, rectify this because uh, obviously that just is... Um, it's, it's really shameful that that's the situation. Denzel, PC party? Uh, we offer the same uh, tax cuts and benefits that everyone else, the Indigenous community is, is eligible for, for those to, to, to put more money in their pocket for the tax cuts, just as everybody, everybody else is. Peter Sabins. Yeah, as I said earlier, we are committed to building 65,000 units of rental housing in Ontario. Uh, we're going to target a chunk of that to the First Nations communities. We're also committed to putting 30,000 units of supportive housing on the market. Um, a lot of the people who are homeless have problems with addiction or mental health. They need supportive housing, not just regular rental housing. And we're gonna be providing support to Indigenous friendship houses. A lot of the work they do is around housing, and we think we can support them to help people get it in a house. Peter Milchin. So we've been working with the Indigenous communities on an Indigenous uh, housing strategy. Uh, as Peter said, part of that is, is creating more uh, housing in communities across uh, the province. The, the portable housing benefit uh, that we've uh, started rolling out in Ontario, that the federal government will do a, a bigger version of that, that's going to be helpful. Uh, but in the far north, uh, really, we need to enable those communities to come up with their own housing solutions. I mean, we will provide funding for it, uh, but don't try to import southern types of housing into far northern communities. We have to work with them for them to recapture sort of their, their traditional methods and traditional materials to come up with housing that will work for them. Understood. That is our time, everybody. We appreciate you coming into TVO tonight. Denzel Min Wong, the PC candidate for Don Valley East, Stacey Dankert, the Green Party's candidate in Kitchener Centre, and the two Peters on the other side of the table. That's Peter Milchin, Minister of Housing, Liberal candidate Etobicoke Lakeshore on the right of your screen, and Peter Tabbins, the NDP candidate for Toronto Danforth on the left. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.